has purchased with his own blood. First Peter chapter 5 says that we that are under shepherd, under Jesus, we must not do it for filthy lucre's sake, but we must feed the church of God, not for filthy lucre, not as lords over God's husbandry, but as an example to the flock. Now I want to say that the role of the pastor is very, very crucial to church health. In fact, later this year, I'll be announcing to you, in May this year, we'll be doing a special conference for pastoral trainers, those that train pastors. We are going, we still slay the venue for here, if they can improve what they are doing here, because I don't like the way they put us in darkness here. But if they don't do, I will take it somewhere else. But we are bringing people from West Africa. We call it Wapriko, West African Pastoral Trainers Congress. It's for geos, Bible school heads, and everything. Before we go tomorrow, I'll get the flyer to you so that if you know a Bible school head or if you are involved in pastoral training, we want you in that conference. Because you see, all said and done, there can be no healthy local church if there is no healthy local pastor. The key to everything we are saying is the pastor. If we want God to come back, we want Jesus to come back, we want the church of God to be what God wants the church to be, the pastor, you the pastor, very crucial. And for those of us who are geos, those of us who are in charge of doing training for pastors, it's time we buckle up and focus on every one of us becoming healthy pastors. So it's very important. So how do you become a healthy pastor? Let's quickly rush through that. A healthy pastor is a God called, God placed, God growing, spirit filled, and godly man or woman in God's church at God's time. Underline that. Very crucial. A God called man, a God molded man or woman, a, a growing person, a growing person that is growing in the law. That's a pastor. The pastor is not a church, but God has decided not to do anything in the church in the absence of the pastor. Pastor is very crucial. Someone with a shepherd's heart. To feed, to nurture, to train, and to empower people with a shepherd's heart. A pastor is somebody that had a heart to shepherd people, to gather people, to nurture people, to train people, to equip people, to empower people. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 10, that he's not a hireling, somebody that wants to go here and there. No, a pastor is somebody that had a heart to sit with people. And turn them to who God wants them to be. Without any envy and jealousy. A pastor is someone that cares, visits, shares, understands, or prays in love at people's level. He can pick them from low level to high level. That's a pastor. He cares for people. Not because of what he wants to get, get or gain. No, he just loves to see people become what God wants them to be. That's a pastor's heart. Because if you don't have that heart, you can't pass up people. Someone that can gently, wisely, firmly take people from where they are and they are to where they should be. He will do it wisely. He will do it gently. He will do it wisely. But he will do it firmly. As a pastor. Someone that truly imparts spiritual grace, growth, and hunger for God in others. Not hunger for himself, but hunger for God. He point them to Christ. Point them to Jesus. Can impart that hunger by his own personal examples. Someone that patiently restore, revive, and renew people's commitment to God. Look at that. Someone that spends time to invest in the life, in the family, and the well-being of his sheep. That's a pastor. Someone who sacrifices time talent, treasures to set godly and worthy examples for the sheep to follow. Someone that is truly happy to see others rise, grow in the Lord and do God's will. May God give us pastors. I can't hear your amen. amen. Lay your hand on your chest. Lord, make me a pastor after your heart. I can't hear your prayer. Make me a pastor out of your... Lord, give me a pastor's heart. I can't hear you praying. Give me the heart of a true shepherd. That's God, what God needs for his church. 
Because where the shepherd is okay, it's okay, it's okay. Because where the shepherd is not available, the sheep will scatter. Did you hear Jesus? He said, I saw Israel like a sheep without shepherd. The same thing God is seeing our churches today. Because when the shepherds are not available, the sheep will perish. There are so many people in position today, but they are not pastors. You know, of the fivefold gifts, I said it in the introduction. The pastoral gift is the most important gift. It's the gift that takes people to heaven. Apostles can go, break new boundaries, break new boundaries, plant churches. Prophet can point out. You had an uh, apple last night. This is what happened to you. The Lord is saying this. Prophet can point out. Evangelists can bring miracle signs and wonders. Supernatural demonstration. Like the one we saw here last night. That's an evangelist. Teachers. They can teach you. They can teach you chronic things. Bring things to light. Things you didn't take notice of. Teachers can do that. But the one that will nurture them. That will keep them. That will multiply them. That will some paper them. That will polish them. That will raise them up. Is the pastor. So when the people truly lack pastor. They lack God in their life. And they will never get anywhere. May God raise two pastors for us. Pastors that care for the sheep. Pastors that spend time for the sheep. Pastors that sacrifice for the sheep. Pastors that feed the sheep, not the one that flees the sheep. How do you know there's a difference? Feeding the sheep is giving them food. Fleecing the sheep is cutting their wool to sell until the sheep are naked and they are open to the elements to destroy them. So, for us today, it is what we gain from the people their motors, their cars, their fridges, and everything. That's what we are after. Not feeding them to become what God wants them to be. May God destroy that spirit in his church in Jesus' name. A healthy pastor plays a great role in the Christian life, journey, and destiny of many believers. After God, the next most important person in a Christian life is the pastor. Your pastor is important. You can see Pastor Ladoku talking about me. He was once my pastor. That's why he knows me inside out. He will always tell me in those days, say, Francis, Francis, Arai Bale. <laughs> and he studies me, he knows me very well. I'm not surprised what he's saying about me, but I've changed you. <laughs> yeah, he plays a great role. And when I say God called me into ministry, even when I started Bible school in 1986, he was the first person to give me his platform to preach. In fact, he will leave church. He will go to another place to say, I should preach. I'll be wondering, say, what kind of pastor is this one? What will I say? And you say, I should preach. You say, Francis, you have message. Preach. Preach for me. And many times he will ask me to write his messages for him. Like when he finished this morning and when he came there, I said, ah, pastor, that's a good one. He said, ah, is it today you started writing messages for me? You write and I preach it. I'll be, you'll be doing it for a long time. And that's the way we've been coming. I write messages for him. He preaches it. One of them are somewhere there. Bowo. Me, say, it's okay. So, okay, man, I'm going to say, come on, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm trying to tell you that pastors have played a great role in my life. I have another pastor who married me and my wife. He was there yesterday. Who married me and my wife 26 years ago. He was there yesterday. Those are people that God used for me. More than what my parents can do. These pastors have done it in my life. I own God, my ministry, and those pastors. The same thing if you tell your story. God favors you if you fall under a good pastor. He's the greatest favor you can receive in your life. If you fall under a pastor that is not threatening with you, that is patient with you, that can raise you up, who well, is the greatest favor you can have. A pastor will take you to even where your natural parents cannot take you to. And if you happen to fall under a, an Ebola pastor, ah! May God give us good pastors. 
May God raise us good pastors. And I'm sincere with that prayer. That's the gift that will survive the church here. That the gift of pastoring will determine the heaven of many people. That's why if you look at your outline, I can't finish it. But that's why we gave you the outline. That's why. It's not for you to decorate your house with this outline. It's for you to go over it again and again and again. And if you have pastors, you have workers, you have leaders, go and use it to teach and to train them. Because you know what? The, the, the believer of today, the Christian of today, is the pastor of tomorrow. So use it to teach them. Pastors are very crucial. They are very crucial. Look at the 30 kinds of pastors that the church needs today. I hope you can grow yourself to become one of them. Those qualities must be in your life. The church needs a purpose-driven pastor. A pastor that knows God's purpose for his life and for his ministry. And is being driven, controlled, directed by that purpose. He needs a principal pastor. A pastor that builds his life and his ministry on the word of God. We, the church needs a powerful pastor. A pastor that is anointed with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit like we learned yesterday. The church needs a, path, a prayerful pastor. A pastor that can pray and pray down the power of God and pray down the glory of God into the life of the sheep and the members. The church needs a pastor that is passionate. Passionate for God. A pastor that is progressive minded. Not a pastor that is retardation minded. A pastor that has prophetic dimension to his ministry. Yes, we need such pastors. I remember when I was pastoring, I prayed to that level that God make me a prophetic pastor. And you know, God answered my prayer in a very queer way. I learned in Bible school that the message you are going to preach on Sunday, you must have been preparing things since Monday. But when I pray that prayer, when God will answer, I can't prepare my messages from Monday. In fact, sometimes on Sunday morning, I have not prepared my message. But I learned something. I learned that a pastor must get to church first. So I always arrive church before anybody. One day I arrived church, I met one member. I said, what are you looking for? He said, pastor, you are the one that said we should come to church early. I said, you are too early. You are too early. Like a kilo one shot she. He said, ha, pastor. I said, don't ha, ha. Next time, come to church by 7.30. You are too early. Because she came before me that day. I just use that to for her to bamboo her. my pastor alone, no So next Sunday I came to church five thirty. Because I've learned that if I want to preach prophetically, I must come to church early. So I came, I bless the chairs, I bless the benches, I pray everywhere, I command demons to go, I welcome the Holy Spirit, I create the atmosphere that I'm looking for. Then you know I'll go and sit on my table. And as members are coming in, it's as if something opened my eye. I'll be seeing all their problems. And some will be telling me, this is the message you preach. This is the scripture you quote. This is how you illustrate it. This is how you tell them. So that you can reach them. You know, that's what I'll do. Every Sunday, that's how it happens to me. And you know, it got to a point. My members labor me. They say, pastor is a winch. Anything you do in your house, pastor will use it to preach. Even what they are discussing when they are coming to church, I'll be illustrating it. But I didn't tell them what was happening to me. But that made them to be afraid of sin in the church. Because they started telling themselves, whatever you do, pastor will see it too. That pastor, he will see it too. And when they come, they greet me, I just say, how are you? Because I'm seeing something different. Somebody walking, I'll see something following him or her. Mm -hmm. I wish I can be pastoring again. He said, we should, but uh, it will not come to pass. I've gone that level. Me one now, she joke him only ever. You are blessed forever. We need a prophetic pastor. That's what I'm saying. A pastor that will see from God and preach the messages in the light of issues that are affecting people's life. We need a prudent pastor. We need a pragmatic pastor. A productive pastor. A pastor that God has pruned very well. He has pruned you and removed all the hindrances from your life. A pastor that is penitent, not a hard hearted pastor. A peace loving, a praiseworthy pastor. A pastor that is a good preacher of the word of God. That can use his preaching to convince and to convert people to Jesus. That's the pastor we need. 
A pastor that is a problem solver, that is free from prejudice, that is proactive, not reactionary. A patient pastor. A pastor that allows others to participate. is not threatened by the potentials and the gifts of others. A pastor that is very practical, can make the word of God practical and relevant to people. A pastor that has a positive attitude, not a negative pastor, not a sarcastic pastor, not a pastor that sees the cup half empty instead of seeing it half full. Okay, a, a possibility thinking pastor. The pastor that will say, yes, we have not got to where we are going, but we thank God for where we are coming from. I see you rising. I see you shining. I see your glory. I see God over your life. You are not saying amen. amen. Are you not my congregation? Huh? I, I presently am your pastor now. You don't say you gonna. I see you rising. I see you shining. I see your glory. I see God using you. You will shake the world for him. In the name of Jesus. Believe God and believe me. You will shake the world for Christ. Yeah. People can come the way they are. But when they come under your pastoral leadership, they must never remain the same. It's not only testimony of I built house. I have a job. Hey! Must be testimony of I was once an armed robber and I got converted on your message. I was a white beater. I beat my wife. But when I listened to you, that spirit left me. That should be the testimony. I was a heavy drunkard. I was a womanizer. But the moment I step into this door, I hear you preaching and stay under your leadership. My life was changed forever. That should be the pastor. And that's the pastor God is looking for. And that's the pastor we need for the church of today. A persevering pastor. That even though the result did not come immediately, you persevere. A pastor that don't easily give up. A pastor that believes that God answers prayer in phases and in stages. A pastor that is free from any phobia, ungodly phobia, ungodly fear. A pastor that is profitable to God, profitable to people. A pastor that is a paragon of God's glory and beauty. God's power, God's presence in his life. A pastor that is persistent in his ministry. A pastor that has heaven and paradise in his heart and can lead people to heaven. May God make you that pastor in Jesus' name. How can you become such a healthy pastor? Number one, live an open and transparent life. Let there be no secret in your life. Let there be no secret dealings in your life. Look, if you have an area in your life you are struggling with, open up. Another name for sin is cover me and I will kill you. If there are sins you are covering your life, open up, oh. open up. Don't let that sin kill you. And as a pastor, if you are into immorality, look, there is no repenting you repent that can deliver you except another mentor or leader minister to you. If you are falling into adultery once, you sleep with a member or you sleep outside and you can come out, oh, you can repent, oh, you can answer altar call, oh, but as a pastor, that will not deliver you from that sin. You need another pastor. A one that is holier, has carry more authority, carry more grace than you, to lay hands on you after your sincere confession and your repentance and break that bondage in your life. If not, you will be falling and rising. I remember we went to Paracourt many, many years back. Went to do a church go conference in my three, one Anglican church there. So when I finished my own session, I have another meeting in Lagos. So I was rushing to the airport. Before I left, one elderly man, he was around 60 then, or oh, around 55. He called me and said, I need to see you. I know you are going to the airport, but I need to see you. Ah, impatiently, I said, Baba, what is it? Look at the story he told me. He said when he became a new Christian, he fell into immorality and he repented. He was forgiven. When he became a worker in the church, he fell into the same immorality. He was disciplined among the workers. He repented. He was forgiven. He said when he became a pastor, he also fell into immorality. He repented and he was forgiven. He said now he's a Jew. He's still falling into the same immorality. He said but from what you preach, 
I discovered I have a problem. I said, yes, Baba, you really have a problem. I said, in all those years, you only repented. Nobody break that bondage in your life. Because the book of Proverbs chapter 23, verse 27, says a whore, a prostitute, is a deep ditch. It's a narrow pit. Imagine a pit, a hole that is narrow and deep. When you fall into it, you need help to come out. If nobody help you, you'll be there forever. That's what has happened to people. That's why when you become a pastor, sin of immorality or stealing or falsify account is not something you can repent and you cover it and you say, I am free. You will never be free. Because you are falling into a deep, narrow pit. You need to confess openly. And so, that's why you need to have a mentor. You need to have a father. You need somebody that can smack you on your head and say, are you crazy? You say, no, sir. Someone that can rebook you. But we have got, like the Lord said in the morning, we are too arrogant for our own good. We are too arrogant. Uh -huh, for me to confess like that. Who are they, by the way? Eh, stay in your sin. What's the problem there? And eventually that sin will sink you. So live a open and transparent life. If you want to be a healthy pastor. I have not seen a pastor that is an immoral pastor. A thief and a robber. A liar and a drunkard that succeed in ministry. Pray and walk through to victory over your personal challenges. Over your personal demons. Pray. Open up yourself. Number three. Make sure you welcome the Holy Spirit back into your life. In his power. So you are led by the Holy Spirit. Not demonic spirits. Yes. Make sure you develop. You grow. You improve. And you are disciplined. Like the message of yesterday. The discipline of a healthy minister. I love that message. Any minister that is not disciplined. In what you see, in what you look, in your thoughts, in your word, in your action, in public, in private, the way you handle money, the way you handle opposite, even discipline with your husband and with your wife, you will make a mess of your ministry. Discipline should be our watchword. Ability to deny yourself. Ability to say no, even to your legitimate right. Someone says, I want to claim my right. You will claim it in hell. You better allow your right to go, daddy. If you want to remain disciplined and at peace with God. You don't need to claim right. Let God fight for you. Develop and grow. Improve. Go and buy my book. Personal growth today. Lead yourself first before you lead any other person. If you are a failure at leading yourself, you will be a failure at every area of ministry. You can't be a successful, a healthy pastor if you can't lead yourself first. In that book, I told the story of uh, during the Emperor Nero, Emperor Nero, who was a tormenting, oppressive emperor, that when he's coming, everybody must bow down their face, on their faces. Kneel down, bow down your face, and let his horse gallop and pass you by. You don't look the emperor on the face, neither should you stand up. And when he's coming, somebody will blow a trumpet, Pa 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 pa! Hey, the emperor, and everybody on their faces. But the story says that he was coming one day at the outskirts of town, and they blew the trumpet. Pa 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 pa! Hey, the emperor, and everybody bowed down, and his horse was coming and coming. When he got to where the people were, he stopped. Because why? He saw one old man standing ramrod straight, refusing to bow down. That was strange. So he stopped. And who are you? He shot back at the old man. The old man said, I'm a king, my lord. A king? He said, yes. Over quit kingdom. My Lord, over myself. He was speechless. He looked at him. And he galloped away. 
And that's the truth, brethren. You can't be a pastor outside if you have not been a pastor inside. You can't rule over others if you have not ruled over yourself, over your emotions, over your intentions. May God help us. May God uphold us. People that say, women before you, and this one, you are tempted. All of us are tempted. Like Reverend Father just said yesterday, all of us are tempted. If I tell you my encounters, you'll be amazed. I didn't say I stand by the grace of God. I mean, I didn't say I stand by my strength, but by the grace of God, I was a virgin until I married. And since I married, I can give glory to God. I've never climbed the chest of any other woman. That's 26 years ago. It was my wife that is virgin me. And I'm still a virgin till now. <laughs> oh, does that tell you I have not seen temptation? I've seen. In the course of ministry, I've seen women nakedness. Even one woman told me, well, Francis, you must sleep with me, oh. If you don't, what I will do to you? I said, madam, I will sleep with you. On one condition. He said, what's the condition? I asked her a very stupid question. But it was the question that saved me. I didn't know how I got to that question, but it was God that gave me the question. He said, what's the question? I said, Shabby, you know, say I married. She said, yes. Does that stop you from sleeping with me? I said, I want you to deposit your future into me. Eh? This is not a question of either you are married or not. Give me your future. Just like Joseph. To the wife of Mrs. Potiphar. Oh, uh, Mr. Potiphar. I said, on one condition. If you can answer that question, I will do it. I will send my future to you. He said, oh yeah, what's the question? I said, Shabby, you know my wife. She said, yes. I said, her own sexual organ is where everybody's own is. I say, your own. Is it in that normal place or another place? They said, what kind of foolish question is that? I say, answer it now. I say, because I have a lot of friends, like Pastor Daniel, like Baba, and the rest of them, and Baba, you lie, everything. By the time they hear that I sleep with a woman, they will ask me, what pushed me to read? Then I will say, her own sexual organ, no? now here it is. Now here it is. Now here it is. Now here it is. Now, hey, just for the change of environment. That's what pushed me to read. But if your own is in the normal place, you are failed. He say, hey, you the craze. I say, you two get demon. You get demon. You see a whole servant of God. You say you want her to deposit his life into you. And you get a mission. You're like, no mommy. That's what delivered me from her. And I was in a tight corner. But that's what God used to save me. It's the grace of God. But it's also discipline. If you want to be a healthy pastor, you pass through many temptations. Like Reverend Father, uh, Father you told us yesterday, Jesus was tempted at all points, including this point. And yet without sin. Build your life, your family, and work and ministry on the undiluted word of God. Then stand in the truth, stand for the truth, stand by the truth, and defend the truth always. Engage in persistent and prevailing prayers. Build your prayer life. Don't let your prayer life go down. He, the devil, can destroy your prayer life. He has destroyed your ministry. Pursue his vision, not your own agenda. Don't build your own empire. Build his vision. Work according to the vision he gave to you. If he calls if call you to the ministry of evangelists, don't be a pastor. And if you're a pastor, disengage yourself from being a pastor. Go and do your ministry. The secret of seeing God's power in your life, in your ministry, is that you are doing what he says you should do. If you to be an evangelist and you are functioning as a pastor, you will never see God's power. Because God will never pay for what he has not ordered for. Be problem solving and solution oriented and don't be a problem to your church. Then be courageous to confront change and change and confront change and change and change because if you don't change, they will change you. Don't pastor with hearts and bitterness. I can't overemphasize that. Please, don't ever do ministry with bitterness. Am I talking to somebody? That's the point I want us to pray. Don't ever do ministry with what? With bitterness. Be accountable. Have a mentor. You know at the back of the outline, I told you, we have a growth network of churches and ministry there. You can fill that form and return it to us. That's part of our mentoring. And you, we can hey, help one another in the church, in ministry, and all that together. And I can call a meeting. So the form is at the back. 
You can fill it and submit it to our ushers or to the table there. If you are interested new, that's part of our accountability. We can be accountable to each other and help one another so that your ministry can get better. <laughs> nothing more, nothing less. And we'll have a bi-monthly meeting that will do about that. If you fill the form, we can send the test to you. But that's by the way, this is where I will round up. Don't ever do ministry with bitterness. I know in the course of ministry, you help people, they backstab you. You help this one, they shot your arrow. This one, they stole your money. This one, they pull you down. This one, they went to town and start saying nasty things about you. And people didn't ask you, they believed them. Don't worry. Don't worry. Leave them alone. But don't let bitterness enter your heart. Because if you do ministry with bitterness, you will die before your enemies. Where do I get it from? Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 15. He said, don't let us be like Esau. Who for one more sale of meat sold his battery? And we should, not do, we should not allow any root of bitterness that would defile us. I know in the course of ministry, you have been injured. Your husband injured you. Your wife injured you. Your district injured you. Your children injured you. The people you labor over injured you. Even the people you preach to, they injured you. So there are a lot of hearts and bitterness inside you. God will heal you this afternoon. Stand up on your feet. That's where I want us to pray. Somebody broke away from your church. Somebody backstabbed you. Somebody accused you of what you did not do. And you have bitterness in your heart. It must not continue there. Because you see, the person that offends you is another case entirely. You, that you allow bitterness, is another case entirely. I'll tell you a story. It happened in the church of Aji. That one that ministered last night. It happened in his church. He said, a woman came and said, Pastor, pray for me. I have three girls. My next pregnancy, I want it to be a boy. He said, as she lay hands and start praying, the Lord said, no, don't pray for her. Because her husband offended her and she has decided not to forgive the husband. So there's no baby boy for her until she forgives. He said, so he said, Madam, your husband offended you. She said, yes. Forgive him. He said, lie, lie. Lie, lie. Not in this life. Ah. He said, he told the woman, well, if you don't forgive him, the one who owns the baby say he's not giving you baby. Say, hey, let him carry his baby boy. And she was coming to church every day. One year later, she came. Pastor, pray. Have you forgiven him? Say, never. I say, I'm not forgiving him. And the one who owns baby say, no baby. Two years later, pastor pray. He said, no. Have you forgiven him? He said, not yet. I'm still thinking about it. And pastor say, the one who owns baby say, no baby, until you forgive. It was the third year. She said, eh, I'm now ready to forgive. Okay. She needs a baby boy. And she says she's ready to forgive. Baba, please, give her a baby boy. And when he finished praying, he said, when you get back home, tell your husband that you have forgiven him. So when she got back home, she called the husband and said, it's today I forgive you what you did seven years ago. The husband said, eh? So we are living in the same room, the same house. We are sleeping together as husband and wife. You are holding me inside. She said, yes, so I tie you down here. But today I went to pastor. Pastor said, I should forgive you. I forgive you today. So come and sleep with me and give me baby boy. And the husband slept with her. And she had the baby boy. That's your condition. When you hold the grudge. Me, I've decided in my life. People have done things against me. Of course, all of you have heard stories about me. Whatever. I'm not ready to defend either yes or no or true or whatever. But people have done a lot against me that I've decided I'm not going to live in bitterness. 
I won't do this ministry with bitterness. God will help me. I will never do ministry with bitterness. Because you see, when you become bitter, the problem is no more the person, what they did against you. It's your own problem now with God. Raise up your right hand. I release bitterness in my heart. I forgive those who offended me. Make me the pastor after your heart. Oh, yeah.